בדיוק הרי שבוי מותח. Shana Tova, ladies and gentlemen. I feel like this mic is about to attack me at any moment. I'm trying to push it down just a little bit. I, I'm honored to be here at the Mashadi community, but I'm a little bit dismayed to discover that you discriminate against short people. <laughs> That's the triumph of mind over matter. The story goes that a man is driving his car down the highway, the 495, toward the Hamptons driving his pristine, beautiful, new red Ferrari. <clears throat> when suddenly it spins out of control and it slides into an oncoming truck and this beautiful $300,000 car is totaled and the man jumps out of the car and he looks at this wreck, this heap of metal that is now scrap before him. And he screams, my Ferrari, my Ferrari. And quickly a state trooper drives up behind him and looks at him and says, sir, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but forget your car, your right arm is 50 feet down the highway on the other side of the road. And the man looks at the empty socket where his shoulder once was and he screams, My Rolex! <laughs> the only people that laugh were people wearing a Rolex. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have been asked tonight to speak to you about the real enemies of faith. And should time allow us, we will discuss three principal enemies of faith. The first being, as in my story, materialism, the lust for objects. The second being superstition. And the third being perfection. I will watch the clock because I know we're limited in time. But I feel I owe you an explanation before I begin. You see, although I live about a half an hour from here, and although I have encountered many people from the Mashabi community over the years, this is the first time I've been invited to address you. 
And no doubt the reason that it has taken so long for me to address you, such an established, esteemed, and world famous community, even though I am half Persian myself, is that I'm controversial. Shmuel, you have to accept you're the man who wrote the book, Kosher Sex. You're a controversial rabbi. In fact, one of the organizers tonight came over to me and he said to me, I hope that you will not be offended if people approach you as being somewhat controversial. So I have to address that immediately. It would be unfair if I didn't. It is true, ladies and gentlemen, that I did write a book called Kosher Sex. But lest you believe any of the untrue rumors that my rabbinical colleagues had any problem with that book, I am proud to announce to you, for the first time, this community, that my rabbinical colleagues have all come together and put together a fund to help me promote that book, and they're sending me on a tour, a book tour to promote the book, beginning right after Sukkot, in Tehran, Kandahar, and Beirut. <laughs> I am greatly looking forward to that tour. And I appreciate the love and affection that went into raising those funds. They've also bought for me for the tour a special I Love Netanyahu t-shirt that I will be wearing through all of those cities. And I look forward to reporting back to you on its progress. beginning of the Torah. When a man and a woman first inhabited a place called paradise, what made it paradise? What made it the Garden of Eden? What was there that could have made it special? There were nothing but trees and flowers. But they had each other. And because they had each other, they had everything they needed. And they had happiness. Until one day, Eve, Chava, is walking through the garden. And the serpent sees her. And she's smiling, and she smiles every day. And he says to her, why so happy? And she says to him, why not? I have all my needs taken care of. I have a man that loves me. I have a home that's pretty enough, beautiful enough. I have everything. But the serpent is cunning and clever. He looks at her and he says to her, everything? Pray tell me, that tree over there, the eight Sadad Tovara, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What does its fruit taste like? And here Eve is stumped. Because it is the one thing she doesn't have. You see, God has forbidden the consumption of its fruit. So she says to the serpent, okay, I correct myself. I don't know what that fruit tastes like because it is the one thing that I've never eaten. And then the serpent says something so devastating that it will alter human history forever. He looks her dead in the eye and he says to her, if you don't know what delights that tree has to offer, then how do you know you're happy? Maybe its joy is so phenomenal that it will cause everything you have to pay. 
pale by comparison. Maybe you only think that you're happy. Eve comes home. And she's not as alive as she was before she left the house. Adam looks at her and he says to her, why so sad? And she says, I don't know. I've been thinking. He says, thinking about what? She says, I've been thinking about certain things about our life together. And he says to her, tell me more. I don't want to see you sad. What's bothering you? And she says to him, I know that we have this nice house. I know that we drive a decent car. But I wonder what it's like to live in one of those neighborhoods we can't afford. I wonder what it's like to travel to one of those vacation destinations that remain forbidden because it's outside our reach. I wonder what the forbidden fruit tastes like. And now for the first time in his life, Adam experiences insecurity. Because are you a real man if you can't keep your woman happy? If you can't provide her all that she needs? Just this morning, she was satisfied with her life. But now, she is focused not on what she has, but on what she lacks. The genius of the serpent. And the reason he changes all of us till this very day is that he simply focuses our attention away from what we have. They had the whole garden, every fruit, onto the one thing they don't have. And they start obsessing over what they don't have. And they start lusting after what they don't have. And they begin clamoring for what they don't have. And they begin to lose an appreciation for all that they possess. And now, they have children who aren't good enough because the neighbor's kids got into Harvard. And what did you get into? A community college nearby? The neighbor's husband is vice president of an international conglomerate. You run some small law firm, what the serpent did was make Eve and Adam insatiable. He ensured that no matter what they possessed, it could lend them no happiness. I know husbands who've been married to women for 20 or 30 years, whose wives have given them everything They've given them their identity by taking their last name. They've given them their body and their figure by having children, irrespective of how it would alter their figure. They've given them their youth by marrying them young, and now they're in their 40s or 50s. And do you think the husband appreciates that gift? Or does he look at the forbidden fruit? The woman he can't have. Focusing on all of the pleasures that are off limits to him. While he has a loving wife right there in his own home. The secret of the serpent is that he bites us and he injects his poison into our bloodstream. And if you've ever, God forbid, been bitten. By a snake, you know that its poison is cold, ice cold. It makes you cold to everything you have. Suddenly, your children are not a blessing, and your home is not a blessing, and your friends are not a blessing, because you're not Warren Buffett, and you're not Steve Jobs, and you're not some NFL quarterback, and if you're a woman, you're not as thin as you want to be, you're not as young as you want to be, your legs aren't long enough, your body isn't shapely enough. Your hair is not the right color. Not enough, not enough, not enough. And you walk around the entire time feeling utterly deprived. And it turns you into a machine. 
You're not even a human being anymore. You are a workaholic. And you live to impress your friends. You make a bar mitzvah, and the last thing on your mind is that your child has now entered the covenant of Abraham, joined a community of faith believers, 3,300 years old, who have altered the world with the mighty majesty of God the Creator. That is the last thing on your mind. Less so what is on your mind is that your child will get up there on this bima and he will read the Torah. He will read it without vows. He will do so after having been trained for 11 months. He will be part of a tradition, a chain that is unbreakable, nuclear in its force. No, that's not what will be on your mind. What will be on your mind is impressing your friends with that bar mitzvah so they can walk out cooing over how much cash you blew on that celebration to finally signify that although you are an immigrant to this country, my God, have you finally arrived. You have arrived. No one's keeping you down. You have taken a bar mitzvah and you have made it into a vulgar and ostentatious display of look how much money I have. Your son is an afterthought. And as a result, it even vulgarizes the commitment in his own eyes. Do you know that a father came over to me and he said to me, very rich man. He's a part owner of a sports team. And he comes over and he says to me, you know, the kids these days, they have so much chutzpah. They don't even know how to respect their elders. He said, why, my own son comes over to me and he says to me, Daddy, get me Kobe Bryant from my bar mitzvah. <laughs> Daddy, get me Kobe Bryant from my bar mitzvah. So I have to teach him values. I have to teach him manners. I said to him, son, you don't tell your father to bring Kobe Bryant to your bar mitzvah. You ask him politely. <laughs> Dad, can I please have Kobe Bryant and my bar mitzvah? It will add so much spirituality. <laughs> the serpent is cold. The Jewish people are coming out of Egypt and they're on fire. They've defeated Paro. God is with them. They believe in themselves. Their souls are alight. But Amalek attacks them very quickly. And Rashi says, Amalek attacking the Jews is analogous to a man jumping into a burning hot bath. The Jews were burning hot bath. People were afraid to touch them, afraid to hurt them. But this man jumps in and he says, I'm not afraid of Jews, and his whole body gets burnt. But in the eyes of the world, that nation is now really cooling down. He got burned, but he survived. They're not as hot as they think. A mullet cools you down. There's an amazing thing about the serpent. He's cursed by God to slither on his belly. And he is cursed by God to eat dust the length of his days. Dust is plentiful, it's everywhere. He will never be hungry. He will always have plenty of food, but with one difference. You can eat all the dust in the world and you're still going to be hungry because it's not filling. That's the curse of the serpent. He makes you want more and more and more, and it's never filling. No matter how much money you have, it's never enough. You buy an iPhone, and Steve Jobs knows that six, seven months later, he can sell you a brand new one with barely any additional features because you're already bored of something that you stood in line five hours to buy. 
The new iPhone's being released October the 5th. I'm a paid spokesman for Apple. <laughs> Why do you think we have problems of obesity in America? What is obesity other than an experience where no matter how much you eat, you are still hungry? You eat and you eat and you're never satisfied. My friends, we all seek novelty in our lives. We all seek renewal in our lives. But there's two ways to bring newness into your existence. There is the vertical, and there's the horizontal. The horizontal means I'm bored. I'm bored with my marriage, so I'll find a new woman. Okay, I won't find a new woman because I don't want to get caught. I'll go on the internet and I'll look at all these images of women. I'm a woman who's bored of a relationship, so I'll buy things, I'll shop. I will acquire new things. The number one remedy for depression in America is shop. I'm bored, so I will acquire new things that bring something electrifying into my life. That's called horizontal. I'm bored, I'll travel to a new destination. The problem is, it's never satisfying. Why do you think eBay exists? eBay exists to, to, to sell all the junk you couldn't live without the day before, for pennies on the dollar. Vertical renewal is where you want something new in your life, so you decide to go more deeply. Your marriage is getting boring, so you start having deeper conversations with your wife about things that you were never prepared to discuss before. And you discover whole new dimensions of both personalities. You know, my own son, Mendy, who's now 18, when he was seven, he goes on the bus one day with a toy that I bought him the day before. He comes home from school and I say to him, where's the toy? And he says, I traded it for a piece of gum. <laughs> now I knew what he was doing. Anyone here know what he was doing? What was he doing trading $20 toy for a piece of gum? He was buying a friend. He was buying a friend. He was giving some kid a toy so the kid didn't like him. I knew this because I had done the same thing. And I wanted to go and tell my wife that when my parents divorced at the age of, when I was eight, and my mother moved us from Los Angeles to Miami, that I was put into a new school and I was bullied mercilessly by the other kids. And my mother used to give me five dollars a week for allowance. And I used to go to the school store with these kids who would bully me, and I would let them buy a pencil, a pen, an eraser with my money so they would like me. And I wanted to explain this to my wife so that she would understand what our son was doing so that we could talk to him about it. I have to tell you, I couldn't do it. I could not reveal to my wife that as a child, I bought kids presents to like me. It was like announcing to her, Mrs. Boteoff, you are married to a short, hairy loser. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 it emasculated me. It robbed me of my masculine. I couldn't do it. And it took me like five days to push myself. And I finally did. Because that's what marriage is supposed to be. Where you vertically dig deeper into the relationship and vertically reach higher for more noble goals, so that you no longer are dependent on vertical renewal, more and more material objects to make you happy. That's what Rosh Hashanah is about. It's a new year, for God's sake. Reach higher, reach deeper. Don't just buy something new. The curse of the nachash, of the serpent, is that he would forever slither on his belly. He would forever be, be horizontal. He would forever look for newer and newer things. And that's what is killing us in America. Many of you in this room 
are like my family. My father's family left Iran in 1952. They resigned as they went to Israel. My mother was an American who meets my father in 1960 while looking for a falafel shop in Beersheba. They get married in Beersheba and they live there in Israel. And after a few years, my grandfather's business needed help. My grandfather wasn't feeling well in New York. So they moved back, planning to stay for a couple of years, and they end up getting settled in the United States. My father doesn't speak the language. His whole cult culture is Persian. I was raised on a steady diet of Khormay Sabzi for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and it's the same story I saw with my father. My father, who is an Orthodox Jew, was going to prove himself in America. By proving himself, he was going to build a business. You see, in America, a man is a success if he comes with all kinds of bells and whistles, if he comes with property, if he lives in the right neighborhood. And you have to go to Los Angeles to see what it's like. You have to see a whole generation of Iranian Jews who kept the Jewish tradition since the times of Bayat HaRishon, the first temple. More than two and a half thousand years, you have to see them now. You have to see the Tiffany's, and the Britney's, and the Mercedes, the Los Angeles Times goes and does a story. I hope some of you read it or read about it. True story. This is about eight months ago. The Los Angeles Times writes a story about extravagant Iranian Jewish weddings. Anyone here familiar with the story that appeared in the Los Angeles Times? One person is nodding their head. This was unbelievable. The reporter was a Jewish woman. She just happened to have gone to a wedding. And the theme of the wedding was, Jewish wedding, was the Phantom of the Opera. So the Chatan arrives with his face half masked, going, The Phantom of the Opera is here. This is how he's going down to the chuppah, inside your mind. In the meantime, they decide to put his kalak in a glass coffin. <laughs> She's Christy, Christy. So she's lying horizontally. You'll notice that the vertical are always alive and the horizontal is the posture of the dead. She's lying horizontally in a glass coffin and he's supposed to come under the hoopah and open the coffin and everyone is supposed to clap and it's so this wedding is going to be remembered and what does it have to do with love and romance? Nothing, but your friends are going to talk about it for the next 10 years. And he tries to open it. Doesn't open. He tries again. Doesn't open. She is suffocating in a glass coffin at her own wedding. The men start taking axes. They're breaking them from the fire glass on the side. Now ten axes are banging away, and the reporter is watching all this. Then the L.A. Fire Department comes. And this wedding is turned into the fiasco of the century. A five million dollar wedding. But that's not so bad. What makes it really bad is that it appears in the Los Angeles Times two days later. You read the story? Someone read the story. It appears in the Los Angeles Times two days later under a story about how Iranian Jewish families are mortgaging their homes, borrowing every penny they have to put on half million dollar weddings because it's the only way you can compete. And I'm reading this and I'm saying to myself, my God, my God. I am part of a community that held on to the law of Moses for two and a half thousand years. We never stopped keeping it when we were murdered by Muslims who saw, who saw us sometimes as a fifth column in their midst. We never gave it up when we were persecuted. We never gave it up when we were slaughtered, when we were killed. You're part of an ancient Jewish people. Where our Ashkenazi brothers were burnt at the stake for affirming a faith in the one God. Where there were pogroms. 
where there were expulsions and out of the phase and crusades culminating in the Holocaust. And after thousands of years of Jewish tradition, when we live in the freest country in the history of the world, this is what Jewish tradition has come to. Money. 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 And I wrote an article about it. And I said, I am a proud Persian Jew. And no one has held on to Judaism like the Iranian Jews. No one. My father shows me scars all over his head where he was beaten at school, at school, by Islamic teachers who in Isfahan would take a rock and crack it over his head because he did something wrong when he was a Jewish child. And he still wore his tzitzit. And he still put on his tefillin. I have a picture in my father's house of the kids at school, the Jewish kids at school. And there isn't a single one of them who's even wearing a jacket. Their clothing is, just consists of patches that were sewn together by their mothers. There isn't a piece of fabric. And still they held on to their tradition. Still they could never be shaken from their being. It was so deeply implanted into their hearts. Until they came to America. And no one forced it, and they were allowed to keep it openly, lovingly. And in America, where you are respected for being a person of faith. And we have allowed the vulgarization of our tradition. Where even in shul, we come to God on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we pray for what? For money, for money, you mean even here, the only place left, you go to a football game, they want your money, bag of peanuts, it's 10 bucks, you cross the George Washington big, Bird Bridge, 12 bucks, you go to Wall Street, every time you invest, Goldman Sachs, they take a small percentage. They want your money. This is the only place left. This is the only place left where we could actually be sincere. And even there, it's going to be about money. And I have to tell you that when I wrote this column in Los Angeles, Many of the Persian Jewish community were very upset at me. They said it was inappropriate. I have never in my life tried to win a popularity contest. And I will not try tonight either. The first enemy of faith is where you turn God into a furry rabbit's foot, making it some form of vulgar superstition so that God becomes He who grants your material desires. And that's not Judaism, my friends. And for all the young people here, if you're going to date, let's face it, the biggest problem in Jewish dating is, the guy comes to me and says, Shmuley, I really want to be a nice girl. Introduce me a nice girl. It's time. I'm tired of all the dating. I want to be a nice girl. So I say to him, I have a girl who's spiritual and kind and funny and alive and she has so much personality. And what's his first question every single time? What does she look like? So when I say to him, well, her hunchback will give you great piggyback rides. <laughs> and yes, it's true, I was having dinner with her last week and her glass eye fell into the soup. But she put it back effortlessly And what's wrong with a woman being bald anyway? <laughs> Immediately, he has lost all interest. Because men can be very superficial. They judge a book by its cover. Conversely, a woman will come to me, I want to be a nice guy. I want to be someone who's special and spiritual. I have an amazing guy for you. He's religious and he's such a good son and he's such a good Jew and he's such a good person. And then her first question every time is, what does he do? And when I tell her, well, actually, uh, he flips hamburgers at the local McDovid restaurant. Uh, anyone else? How about that bad boy hedge fund manager you were talking about? 
What about that guy who's almost never going to come home because he's going to fly around the world doing international finance deals? The one who will ignore me for the rest of my life, but he has a hedge fund. Is he still available? Is he still single? <laughs> my friends, we have one chance to be authentic people. It begins by decreasing our appetite for those objects that make us happy. I have a friend who's an editor in a magazine, and she says to me, I want a new job. I said, why? She said, Shmuley, day and night, I write stories that are supposed to make people fall in love with objects. I'm supposed to make people fall in love with cars. I'm supposed to make people fall in love with clothing. I can't live like this anymore. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's a time for something higher. You know what's amazing? I'm 44 years old. Rabbi Vuitton was very kind to me. He introduced me and said, this is a unique rabbi, etc. People came over to me tonight and asked me to sign copies of their books. And I'm selling copies of my books tonight. Available to find bookstores everywhere. I don't believe in commercializing things. I don't want to be vulgar and I don't want to stand here <laughs> and promote my books. That's just wrong. <laughs> but my hands are stuck. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> Those of you who came over and said nice things. I don't feel like I'm a success. I bet very few men in this room feel like they're a success. I feel like I'm a failure. Because no matter how many books I have, by the way, I've, I've written 26 books, thank God, which is not a big deal, because some have sold 26 copies. <laughs> but no matter what I've done, someone has done more. It's so competitive. It's a never-ending race. No matter how much money you've made, someone has made more. Are the women here really going to live a life where no matter how much you live, you actually feel bad about your life because you're getting older and moving further and further away from perfection? It's an amazing thing to me. This, these bad feelings we have about ourselves, this feeling of inadequacy, that no matter what, we're not good enough. This woman comes to me, for counseling with her husband. And the problem is that she won't let her husband touch her. They have a, a very unhappy marriage. And this is because she had very bad experiences with men in the past. And she starts telling me her entire intimate history, the whole history of her intimate life. Every last detail. I'm a complete stranger. She doesn't know, she knows me for five minutes. She's telling me every private detail of her life. And then I look at her and I say to her, okay, and how old are you? She looks at me like this. How old am I? The chutzpah. <laughs> what a chutzpah. How many boyfriends have you had? Well, 17 counting the one from. But how old are you? How dare you? How dare you? Women today are ashamed to even say their age. Their age. What did you do wrong? I have a friend, I knew it was her 37th birthday last week. And I knew it was her birthday, I said, happy birthday. I said, do you, it, it would be impolite for me as a gentleman to ask what birthday this is? She says, somewhere lower than 40. <laughs> somewhere lower, I said, almost like she's running for president and she has to give her net worth in general terms, somewhere lower than 40. Now here's the question, what did she do wrong at 37? Did she rob a bank? Did she kill someone? That she's so ashamed of her age? Or does she live in a society where the material has become so important that she's convinced that she's moving further and further away from desirability, that people won't desire her? I would never have believed, had you told me, had you told me 20 years ago when this first started, Shmuley, one day, dermatologists are going to make a killing. Having Tupperware style parties at women's homes where they invite their friends 
to have a doctor shove a needle into their head and they're going to pay a guy money to do this and they're going to invite all their friends. Hi, Sally, Cindy, Mary, and Linda. Come over to my house. I have a doctor who's going to shove a needle in your head. Oh, I'll be there at eight. <laughs> but here's what's so interesting about all the cosmetic procedures that women have, but with Botox being the most fascinating of all. Every cosmetic procedure is supposed to make you look younger, make you feel more attractive, with one big difference. Botox is the only one that robs you of your personality. So here I am on a television show in Canada. And the host of the secret to being a good television host, guest is, you can never interrupt the host. And the host has an IFB in their ear. They have to go to a commercial. So you never know. If they're asking you a question, is it rhetorical? Do they want you to answer? You have to look at their eyes. This woman is 50. And she says to me, this new book of yours is a departure from your previous books. I look at her eyebrows. Question? <laughs> Statement? From her hairline to down, she's dead. <laughs> she can't move anything. There is no possible way that I can discern if this is a question or a statement. And I'm begging her, move them. Just show something. And she really wanted to, because she couldn't. Because someone had told her that she looked old at 50. Someone had made her feel inadequate. Someone had put her in the same position as Eve in the Garden of Eden. That she focused on everything she didn't have. That she wasn't young anymore. That she wasn't beautiful anymore. That she wasn't special anymore. My friends, I am tired of feeling like I'm not good enough. If you came to this country from Iran, or if you were born in this country to Iranian parents, you're good enough. You have nothing to prove. Live a righteous life of coming home and having dinner with your children. Prove yourself to them. Compliment your wife and tell her she's beautiful and don't look at other women. And make her feel that she's pretty enough. Come to shul and open that prayer book and be focused and make God feel that he's good enough. That you don't need to leave your Blackberry on and text someone during synagogue because even he is not interesting enough. I am tired of not being good enough. I'm tired of always feeling that my books don't sell enough, that I'm not on TV enough, that I didn't make enough money in my life, that I'm not famous enough, that I'm not well known enough, that I'm not popular enough. I'm tired of feeling like I'm not good enough. There is a reason we come to Shul and Yamim Noraim. It's so God can make us feel that with sins and all, we're good enough. And any rabbi that tells you the message of the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is the opposite. That you sit there sinful and you have to repent of your bad ways. That is a perversion of the message. The message is that every Jew is welcomed into a shul on Rosh Hashanah, even those who come three times a year. We want you. We love you. You're good enough. You matter. Whether you come or not makes a difference. Without you, we're incomplete. We are one nation, one people. Without you filling that seat, the whole shul feels empty. I am tired of living in a country and a culture that always makes me feel like I have to work harder just to prove myself because I was born a big nothing who has to gain the world's attention in order to feel like I matter. I am tired of that message. I will not die. I will choose to live not just to exist. I will no longer be a machine, a man who's a machine, working day and night to prove himself to who? To who? To the people who don't matter. 
They put me on a national TV show called Shalom Alaham. And it's something called the network upfronts. Where you have to go in front of your advertisers and sell your show. Because if no advertisers advertise on your show, you're dead. You're off the air. So the head of the network says to me, we've never had a rabbi or any religious person hosting a show. This is an anomaly. And you have to win them over. This is your one chance. He said, you've got two minutes. I go there. All the hosts from the Discovery Channel are there. All the hosts from the Animal Planet are there. I go in front of all the people and I say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a rabbi. They don't put rabbis on TV. So you're probably wondering what my show is about. It's actually very simple. Every single one of you in this room is an important person. You're here because you control budgets of tens of millions of dollars. The guy from Budweiser is here. The guy from Exxon Mobil is here. The guy from Ford Cars is here. And you're wondering, why should you put your advertising on my show, a guy with the Yama Kutta Beer? I'll tell you why. Because no matter how important you are, each and every one of you is going to come home from this convention. You're going to go home. You're going to walk through the door. And your kids are either going to run up to hug you and say, Hi, Daddy, I missed you. Hi, Mom, how was your trip? Or they're not even going to know you came home. The TV's going to continue to blare. They're going to continue to have iPod earbuds in their ears because you don't have a relationship with them. My show is about this. Are you really a success in life? If the people who mean the most to you think the least of you. Are you a success in life if the people who mean the most to you think the least of you? So you put on some big beautiful bar mitzvah. You put on some gorgeous wedding. And it cost you half a million bucks. And all your friends said, incredible, they must be doing very well. But your own kid who was neglected while you sat there in the office day and night, almost never home, so you could pay for that darn wedding, who has almost no relationship with you. How about impressing him for a while? How about making him feel like he's a million bucks? That's what my show is about. Every Jew in this, in this room, in America, has a debt of gratitude to Franklin Roosevelt. He saved the world from Nazi tyranny. He defeated Hitler. He had five children, and every single one of them divorced. They couldn't sustain a relationship. After he died, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of the United States, wrote a book. And she said, my husband and I had a, we had a challenging marriage. He had an affair. She stopped loving him, but they stayed married. And he said, I know that he was fighting to save world civilization. I know he was busy. But you see, my five kids, had to book an appointment with him through his secretaries whenever they wanted to speak to their father. And yet, he would take off an hour every day in the White House to invite his friends to have drinks with him, every day from five to six, to blow off some steam because he had so many weighty decisions to make. Would it have been so difficult for him to have invited some of his children into those meetings as well? <clears throat> My friends, let the Iranian Jewish community in general, and the Mashadi Jewish community in particular, let it be a light to the Jewish people and to the world. You came from another country and you remained closely knit. You resisted the temptation to assimilate. You ensured that cultural factors that could corrupt your children were kept at bay. You appointed rabbis to inspire you and you respected them and you came to shul and you built beautiful edifices like these. Now it's time. To put the icing on the cake. Now it's time to have the final victory. You built a community, you built families, you reestablish yourselves 
in the world's freest democracy now show that you can live Jewish lives of genuine spiritual devotion now that God has given you the freedom to do so. Let us reverse the curse of Adam and Eve. Let us look at our lives and feel that we have enough. In the coming year, 5,772, let us have the blessing of enough. Let us feel that the money we have is enough so that we instead come to more Shirei Torah, so that we can ascend vertically and not just buy more things horizontally. Let us start keeping Shabbat with greater devotion. There's no place you have to drive to. There's no work that has to be done. There's no phone call that has to be taken. My God, you've done enough. You've worked six days. It's enough. If until now, in the previous years, I know in, from my experience of Iranian Jewry, they're the proudest Jews, but they don't always show it in the streets. If you've walked around without a kippah, if you've walked around without a, a Magin David as a woman, or dressing in a way that you're immediately recognizable as a Jewish woman, you're in America. Let this community be shining examples of Jewish pride to all Jews that you celebrate your Jewishness. The first time I did the Oprah Winfrey show, I sat with Oprah on her couch, I answered her questions, the show is over. Her, her producer turns to me and says to me, you know, Oprah liked you. You could be a regular. I said, wow. I could be a regular. She said, there's one thing you have to do. I said, what? She said, we don't mind the Amica. Oprah loves people who are proud of who they are. But she said, Shmuley, that beard is out of control. <laughs> she said, the beard is out of control. The thing's living it? What is that? <laughs> I looked at her and I said, I'm a wild man. <laughs> she said, you should trim it. I said, I, I can't. She said, no, 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 no. She said, we've had other Orthodox rabbis on the show. They have no beard at all. I know that you're allowed to. Trim it and you'll be on the show more. But the way you look now, you're, you look unkempt. You look like you were raised by wolves. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned to her and I said to her, that's not why I can't. She said, you're right, in Allah, plenty of rabbis trim their beards, and they're amazing rabbis. More religious than me, more pious than me, better Jews than me. But I can't. She said, why? I said to her, because I'll be cutting it for you, and for television. And you're not worth it. You're a nice woman, but television is not worth it. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. And I'm good enough. I am damn good at what I do. You want to have me on to offer advice? I will. But I will not stop. I will not stop being who I am to cater to your expectations. I am a Jew and I am proud to be a Jew. I am part of an eternal nation. I love wearing my kippah on the street. It doesn't make me better than anyone, but it says to the world that you're that no matter what I do in my life, I will only ever be number two. Never number one. I will always be subject to God's law. Right now, there's a trial going on about Michael Jackson's doctor, Conrad Murray. He's being charged with manslaughter. Did he kill Michael Jackson? Even though he didn't intend it. Ten years ago, Michael Jackson and I recorded 30 hours of conversations for the, for the creation of a book. This is the book. He was the most famous man in the world. He had all the money in the world. You know what hurt his life so badly? You know why he lived in so much pain that he couldn't even sleep at night and he had to take propofol to fall asleep at night? They had to take all these drugs during the day to numb his pain and he was not a bad man. He actually wanted to do good things with his life. He really did. But you know what killed him? No matter what he did, he always felt it wasn't enough. He told me a story once that after the Thriller album, when he sold 50 million albums, Guinness World Record, 
largest selling, the stories in the book, you can see it, word for word. This is just transcriptions of the conversations. Word for word. I put in every ad and every uh in the book. I wanted it to be exactly what he said. He sold 50 million copies, and then he was doing the next album, and he said to me, Shmuley, I took a post-it note, and I wrote 100 million. And then I put it on my window, where I, on my mirror, where I shave every morning. A hundred million. Because 50 million wasn't enough, Shmuley. I'm going to do a hundred million. And I looked at him and I said to him, Michael, you have eaten from the forbidden fruit. When will you finally love yourself? He looked in the mirror and saw something he didn't like. So he went for a constant surgery. He looked at his career, it still wasn't enough. And it's true of all of our celebrities. It's true of all of our billionaires. They're not happy because it's about inadequacy. My friends in the coming year, and with this let me conclude, if there's one message you take from what I said tonight, the greatest enemy of faith is the feeling that you are not enough, which leads to materialism. The feeling that you have something to prove. You will read at the beginning of Bered Sheet that you are created in the image of God. You have an infinite part of God in you and you are enough. Every woman here, you are pretty enough and attractive enough and gorgeous enough and loving enough. And stop beating yourselves up in a culture that just wants to make you buy more cosmetics. Stop making Revlon and L'Oreal and Estee Lauder. Some of them are owned by nice Jewish guys, yes. But stop making them rich by thinking that you're not enough. And us guys, let's stop killing ourselves and neglecting everything that's precious. Study more. Be with your families more. Be better friends. Talk about your emotions occasionally. Daven, come in the morning to shul. Make time to be human. Make business secondary. You're not going to starve. And if you live in a slightly bigger house, you'll still be just as content, I promise. Because even if you have a mansion, it'll still never be big enough. And the final analysis, and this is the final story I will tell you. I was always moved by a story. Of a man named Yusuf Arakover whose story was found in a bottle in the Warsaw Ghetto after the war. This is a man who had 11 children, and he writes that they were part of the Warsaw Ghetto resistance, keeping the Nazis at bay. But now the Nazis brought in the heavy artillery and tanks, and they were going to crush the last remnants of the uprising. He knew he was going to die, and he took out a pen and paper, and he started to write, and he said, Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, My name is Yassel Rakover, and I am a Gera Chassid, Chassid of the Gera Rebbe. I have lived my whole life with love of you and fear of you. Avat Hashem and Yirat Shemayim. But now I have buried 10 of my 11 children. A few moments ago, he writes, my last child was sent as a scout by the Warsaw Ghetto fighters to see where the Nazis were coming with their artillery. And as he lifted his head to look and see the Nazi soldiers, he fell back with a bullet between his eyes. And I, and I lost my last child. I now have lost my wife. And as such, I have lost my love. I have buried my children, and as such, I have lost my hope. I have lost all my possessions. I am living like a rat in a broken building, and as such, I have lost my human dignity. But I have taken pen to paper, O oh God. I have taken pen to paper, O oh Lord, because I must tell you the one thing that I have not lost before I die, which I will never lose. And he wrote, I have lived my whole life as a believer in you, O oh Lord, and I shall die a believer as well. I will not lose my faith. You have done everything to convince me that you do not exist. You have done everything to prove to me that you are a myth. You have done everything to show me that you are an invention, a fabrication, that I hold out false hope. But I am stronger than you. I am stronger than you. You will never take away my faith. I am a Jew and I am unbreakable. I am invincible. I am indomitable. I have lived with the love of God and I shall die with the love of God. Shema Yisrael.
Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, his final words. Therefore I declare before I die the ultimate statement of invincible Jewish faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The Iranian Jewish community is the most faithful Jewish community on earth. You have been uprooted from an ancestral homeland. You have now come to a new country. Shall we be less than those who held on to faith when it was ripped from them with bullets, grenades, and mortars? When we live in a free country, should we not choose to keep Shabbat when it's so easy to do so? When you finally get a break from being a human productivity machine whose only purpose is to pump out more cash. Should we not choose to keep Shabbat and not be part of an entertainment industry that says to us, if you don't watch 24-7 of TV, you will be bored with your life. Should we really be part of a culture that makes us addicted to computers and machines and robs us of the personal connection? My friends, I just completed three days with no television, no phones, no Blackberries, and I have three cell phones. And I didn't know how I was going to live those three days before I had to say, I have so much to do. In a week's time, I have one of the biggest events of my life. I hope you'll all come. Uh, Congressman Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader, who is the highest ranking elected Jewish official in American history, and the greatest friend Israel has ever had in the, in the history of the United States Congress, is my guest a week from tomorrow, and I have to get a thousand people there. And I'm thinking, I'm going to take off three days, I can't even work on it. And Eric's doing me a big favor by flying up from Washington just to come to this event. But when the three days were over, about four hours ago, I turned to my wife and I said, I feel so lonely. For three days, I had nothing but my children. It was amazing. I was free. Free at last, free at last. Nothing but prayers to God and my children and meal after meal and it, I was back in paradise. Like Adam and Eve, I lack nothing and there were no forbidden fruits that I lusted after after everything was good enough. Join me in that blessing, ladies and gentlemen, in the coming year. Let us be better Jews. Because I would like to get to know this community better, I just want you to know, and because I need a thousand people coming to our canter, we're charging $25 for tickets. For tonight only, we're going to make we can sell 150 tickets. We're going to make them $10 each, which is a loss for us, believe me. For all of you who would like to come in here, the highest elected Jewish official in American history, who is one of the proudest Jews you will ever meet. And it's in Manhattan. It's 20 minutes from here. And he hasn't given a public lecture in New York in about five years. He lives in Virginia. It's, it's a week from Sunday. We're going to sell tickets for $10. My office, my office is here to sell just 150 tickets, and that's it, at that price. I hope that you'll come. I also have books, but let me tell you one. I have, I have this book, which this isn't even supposed to be here. This is coming out on December 15th, it's Kosher Jesus. I didn't want to tell people about this book because I don't want to be invited back to the synagogue. I don't want to put Rabbi Beton in an uncomfortable position. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, as we go to Sikhot, I'm sorry I'm ending a little bit late. We started a little bit late. Let me just say what an honor it has been to come home to my community to the Iranian Jewish community. I may not be Mashadi, I apologize. I ask your forgiveness. <laughs> My father's from uh, Isfahan. He was planning to go to Mashad, but the bus broke down. <laughs> but even though I'm not Mashadi, please remember the message. I am still good enough. Thank you.